morning and a warm welcome to today's online Claver event. Uh, I'm Ian Rees, Chair of Claver, the Welsh People's History Society. This morning's event is the second in our new spring series on migration in Wales, part one of which is entitled Communities and People. As mentioned uh, at last week's event, we're dedicating the series to the memory of uh, Claver President Howell Francis, whose funeral will be taking place on Tuesday. Um, I understand that some wonderful tributes uh, to Howell were made by MPs from all sides of the House during a debate on Welsh Affairs in Parliament this week. Um, I believe our event secretary, James, will be putting a link on chat for us. Um, before we get underway, uh, just one housekeeping issue. Can I please just remind people to ensure your microphones are turned off during this morning's event? Thanks. Um, following on from our excellent first session last week on new perspectives on global waves, today's event is entitled Revisiting Tiger Bay. To chair the session and introduce our three uh, excellent speakers, it's my great pleasure to introduce Gaina Legal. Uh, Gaina is Chair of the Heritage and Cultural Exchange, a community-based organization that chronicles the heritage and cultural diversity of Tiger Bay and Cardiff Docklands. She recently led the Welsh Government Task and Finish Group undertaking an audit of public monuments, street and building names associated with aspects of Wales black history. Born and raised in Bootown and fiercely proud of her origins in Tiger Bay, she has worked as a nursery nurse, a state registered nurse, a social worker, and in a number of senior managerial posts. Gaynor was a founder member of Wales Anti-Apartheid and was the first black city councillor in Wales. She has worked with like-minded people to establish a number of voluntary organisations such as Full Employ Wales and Bowser the first black domestic violence organization in Wales. At her AGM in December, Gaynor was also elected as one of Clava's four new honorary vice presidents. Gaynor, we are delighted you're able to be with us this morning. Many thanks for chairing today's event. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Good morning, everyone. Um, I won't talk for um, very long because I think um, we want to allow time for debate and questions. So I will move swiftly into introducing our speakers. Uh, the first speaker you'll hear today is uh, Trevor Godbold. Trevor came to Cardiff in 1984 and has lived in Butte Town for coming on 20 years. He's had a long interest in the maritime heritage and has been keen to find ways of telling the story of Cardiff Docks, Tiger Bay and Butte Town to a wider audience. And he has worked to develop a range of partnerships to ensure that happens. He's a trustee and one of the founder members of the Heritage and Cultural Exchange and works tirelessly to put HCE archive into an accessible order. The Tiger Bay and the World website is testimony to the work Trevor's put into HCE. Following Trevor's presentation, we're going to hear from Mamuna Solomon, who identifies herself as Somali Welsh and was born and bred in Butte Town. Mamuna is, spoke, is a spoken word artist, humanitarian, poet, and is passionate about all things equality and diversity. Mamuna has a BSc in Health and Social Care and a Master's in Public Health, both from Cardiff Metropolitan University. Most recently, Mamuna set up the Privileged Cafe, which is an online space where conversations around privilege are held and actions on how to use that privilege for good are formed. The third speaker, who may be a little late and will join us as soon as she can, is Yasmin Begum, who's a 20-something Welsh Pakistani researcher, writer, critic, and creative practitioner and seventh generation Cardiffian. She graduated from SOAS University of London with a BA in study of religions in 2015 and has since worked as a programmer with the Wales Millennium Centre, as a researcher assistant with the ethnic minorities and youth support team, 
and as a freelancer working in film. At the moment, she works as a creative producer for Tipu and as a community engagement officer with the Other Room Theatre. In 2019, Yasmin carried out a digital heritage project looking at the legacy of the 1919 race riots, live tweeting the events to the hour in English and Welsh. She is deeply interested in topics and themes relating to post-colonialism, cultural memory, heritage, Wales, and multiculturalism, especially how it crosses over with Tiger Bay. So that's the introduction to our speakers. I'm going to call on Trevor Godbold to begin his presentation. Trevor, over to you, please. Uh, okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the introduction, Gaynor. Uh, I'll now see if I can share my screen and uh, bring up my presentation. Uh, here we are. I'll, I'll, I'll say a little about uh, Heritage and Cultural Exchange, first of all. Um, as an organisation, it was formed about four years ago uh, to take over and protect a valuable collection of material that over a number of years had been collected by the now defunct Newtown History and Arts Centre. Uh, when we received it, the collection was uh, not well sorted, I've written down here, but it was basically a mess. Uh, and we have uh, and it wasn't and it wasn't catalogued. Uh, we made an application to the National Lottery Heritage Fund, which allowed us to put in place the project Tiger Bay Preserving the Stories. Uh, and that means that we can put the collection into a some sort of order and, and catalogue it. Uh, but uh, but we'll also start we've also started collecting new material. Uh, the National Lottery Heritage Fund project started in uh, January 2019. Uh, we employed a community collections officer uh, who, assisted by a team of volunteers, uh, has been busy tidying up and recording the collection, uh, and we have started an online archive. The collection has some four or 5,000 images <coughs> of people, places, events around uh, Cardiff Docks, Butte Town and Tiger Bay. Uh, there are 800 or more cassette tapes and other recorded materials of uh, uh, oral history recordings, uh, books, magazines, personal documents galore. Uh, uh, yeah, much, much more. Uh, needless to say, uh, COVID-19 has placed a bit of a hold on what we're doing, uh, but we're determined to finish the project uh, uh, by the end of the year is the, the target we've been given. We currently have a small administrative base at Butte Town Community Centre. Uh, the collection itself uh, is, store, is in storage in Glamorgan Archives, where of course it gets the right conditions for proper archive storage. Uh, for the longer term, our business plan uh, sets out three main objectives uh, to create exhibitions uh, from our collection uh, to depict the industrial development of Cardiff and Wales and show Wales multi-ethnic population in a positive light. Uh, we want to work with in partnership with other organizations uh, to encourage a wider appreciation of the role of immigrants and migrants in that development. Uh, and finally, to develop educational materials using the collection uh, and deliver educational programs for schools and adult groups. Uh, we have a steering group that includes representatives of Glamorgan Archives, Cardiff Museum, and the National Museum of Wales. Uh, we already have working partnerships with the Open University and with the venues and visitor services at the Senate. Uh, we're a charity partner with Cardiff Council uh, for the Rugby Codebreakers project. Uh, and, um, and also um, 
our oral history tapes are now becoming part of, uh, of a major UK wide project uh, called Unlocking Our Sound Heritage, uh, which is being led by the British Library and the National Library of Wales. Uh, this means that all our history record oral history recordings will be digitized so that we can make them widely available. Uh, for more, more information about the organization, uh, you can have a look at our, our, our website, tigerbay.org.uk. Uh, the uh, collection is starting view up online uh, on hcarchives.org.uk. That's the end of the advert for Heritage and Cultural Exchange. Um, my presentation today uses material from that collection. Uh, I'll start with what essentially will have to be a uh, brief history of Cardiff Docks, uh, Butte Town and Tiger Bay, and then move on to look at uh, or include and look at some of the community and people that live in the area and, and, and how that has changed. Butte in Scotland is a long way north of Cardiff. And so how does Butte Town get its name? John Stewart, who became the first Marquess of Butte, married into the Welsh-based Windsor family, and which held vast areas of land in South Wales, uh, including Cardiff, uh, a lot of the south of Cardiff and uh, much of the South Wales Valleys. Uh, this, in, this estate was inherited by his grandson, John Crichton Stewart, who's seen here, who became the second Marquess of Butte. It was this man that started the development of Cardiff Docks in the late 1830s. Uh, about that time, Kill was become, becoming a prime, uh, uh, was being used to produce steam power, which would become the prime power for industry, uh, railways, and increasingly for ships. The coal from South Wales Valleys was some of the best for this, uh, and its natural port of export was Cardiff. The coal trade exploded, and over about 80 years, the docks facilities had to continue to be expanded to cope with the uh, increase. The first came the West Dock, a uh, tiny little dock, uh, which was opened in 1839. Uh, later on, we saw the East Dock built, uh, opened in, or first opened in 1855. Uh, only parts of these now remain. The Oval, Oval Basin, uh, which is down by the Millennium Centre now, uh, is the only remaining part of the West Dock, and we see uh, in the East Dock, Atlantic Wharf. The Atlantic Wharf area is uh, the remains of the uh, West Dock. Sorry, East Dock. I get them. I always get confused. But it, but it didn't end there. Um, along came uh, Roth Basin and Roth Dock, and uh, and. Finally, 1907, the Queen Alexandra Dock. I think what's noticeable from this uh, map is the hundreds of lines, which are railway lines, uh, because the, the coal came down from the from the valleys in railway wagons uh, and were loaded uh, at the at, at the at the port. Uh, this image from uh, about 18, West Dock in around 1880 shows ships being loaded and, and what are known as tips lining the dock. Uh, these were literally, the, the, the coal wagons were delivered to the tips and they were literally lifted and tipped into the ship. Uh, Coal was being exported all over the world. Here are some of the uh, countries that are listed as being 
uh, recipient. Uh, France, uh, our nearest neighbor, I guess, uh, is perhaps not unexpectedly at the top of the list, uh, uh, who, and they took about 30% of the uh, of the coal exports from Cardiff. The volumes are increasing here in 18, I think that's 18, 1849. Uh, we're looking at 635,000 tons of coal. By 1899, we were up to eight and a quarter million. And at the end, which is off my screen at the moment, uh, there was te at the top of this chart there in 1913, we had we were exporting uh, ten and a half million tons of coal a year. Cardiff docks were largely about exporting coal, uh, but uh, iron ore, pig iron were imported, and iron and steel products exported. One of the other imports uh, was timber especially for pit rocks, which went back to the valleys, uh, back to the valleys coal fields on the railway that brought the, brought the coal down. All this coal uh, business brought other uh, businesses. This is Butte Street in around 1915. Um, commercial importance is uh, pretty clear. Uh, lying down one side, uh, ships, chandlers, shops, pubs, boarding houses, shipping company offices, and, and much more. All, all, all gone now, of course, apart from you know, all, only the, the wall uh, remains, uh, on the other side of which was, of course, the railways, uh, the danger of the railways and the, and, 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 and the docks. Uh, along with, oh, hang on, I've lost, I've lost myself now. Um, yeah, homes were needed, uh, and uh, for the coal merchants, ship owners, managers, uh, dock workers, and seamen. Uh, so Lord Bew also became a residential property developer uh, as well as a dock owner. His houses were very much upmarket properties intended for the middle-class managers, uh, like these in Loudoun Square. But as Cardiff expanded its boundaries, the middle class has decided that living close to the dusty, noisy, busy docks in their railway network was not for them and moved out to the uh, suburbs. In Loudoun Square and its neighboring streets, the houses were too big for the poorer signal families to afford, and so many became uh, lodging houses for sailors between voyages. Uh, surrounded by pubs, cafes, and the sort of places where visiting sailors found entertainment, that much maligned uh, Tiger Bay was coming into being. This um, aerial view from around 1910 uh, shows how uh, Cardiff Bay and the docks had developed. Um, 19, in 1913, as I mentioned before, there was 10 and a half million tons of coal being exported. Uh, it's 113 coal exporting businesses, uh, 70 firms managing uh, ships, about 320 ships were being managed. Census shows the population of Cardiff increased from uh, 2,500 in 1811 to 180,000 uh, by 1911. Uh, in the next 10 years, another 40,000 people were added to the population of Cardiff. It was a real boom town. Uh, this picture, I think, gives a, a good impression of uh, what Butte Town was and essentially, I guess, what it is now. Uh, um, it divides in uh, at the bottom left here is the River Taff, 
you know, the Morganshire Canal, which I haven't mentioned before, but uh, it is now, of course, the Canal Park. Uh, we have two two docks, the West Dock and the East Dock, and you can see the coal tips lining the docks. Um, three sort of almost segregated areas of buildings. Uh, here, the terraced houses in the in the were largely occupied, I think, by uh, dock workers. Uh, in the middle here was the commercial area with the coal exchange and other uh, offices in it, right in the middle. And, and, and here, uh, a little bit further out, was Logan Square and Tiger Bay. Move on. Uh, but it is often happens with uh, um, with commercial bubbles. It burst uh, by following World War One. There was a slump in the sale of coal. Coal exports dropped. A uh, couple of reasons for this. One was that. Uh, uh, the war had accelerated the use of oil uh, for sh ships and other uh, powering other industries. Uh, for instance, in 1913, 95% uh, of all shipping was uh, coal powered. Uh, by 1930, by 1930, this figure was down to 30, 35%. So a great big drop in the use of coal, and also while during the First World War, South Wales coal was being used uh, to fire the uh, ships of the Royal Navy and the British Empire. Uh, our export markets found other way, other sources for their coal developing their own. So, uh, and then came the collapse of the, uh, of the shipping market in 1920. It got oversupplied uh, and uh, and the Great Depression in the 1930s. Uh, this aero film shot of Roth Basin and Roth Dock uh, seems to uh, show a busy uh, uh, a busy dock, uh, but uh, these are some of the ships that were laid up in in the 1920s because there were no cargoes for them. Butte Town was no longer the boom town it had been. <clears throat> but the people stayed, and we see that Butte Town had become the home for 50 odd nationalities, a veritable League of Nations. Uh, I guess in, current, in the current way of speaking, they were economic migrants, but many of them would have, be, would have regarded themselves as British citizens coming as they did from what was then the British Empire. <clears throat> Some of the earliest seafarer arrivals were from the Cape Verdes. Some are said to be here since the 17th century, uh, but certainly by 1880, they were joined by people from the Caribbean, uh, for the Caribbean islands and Somalia. Uh, uh, very much a mixed community in terms of nationality, race, and religion. Uh, when World War I came, British seamen were called up to fight, uh, and the number of overseas seafarers grew, as many African, West Indian, Arabian, and Asian seamen from the British Empire were uh, hired to fill the jobs. Uh, it added further, of course, to the racial mix in Tiger Bay. Uh, this image taken in uh, Butte Street is of the crew of the steamship Hope Mount uh, that survived a, a torpedo attack uh, in the Bristol Channel. Uh, more than 300 seafarers that had been lodging in Butte Town weren't so lucky as they lost their lives uh, to U-boat attacks. Uh, we've done a uh, research project that identifies and uh, memorializes many of them, 
uh, and you can see them on our website uh, in the file UBO project. World War II, the docks came under the control of the government and was a, and played a major part in the preparations uh, for D-Day and the subsequent involvement of the USA. Uh, this image shows the arrival of some US troops on the troop ship SS Santa Paula, uh, and they were carrying troops in preparation for the D-Day landings. Many US servicemen were camped in and around Cardiff, uh, but theoretically anyway, were banned uh, from Tiger Bay. Uh, needless to say, that ban was not entirely compiled, complied with, and visiting servicemen formed relationships with local girls, and ultimately there were many uh, GI brides. Uh, also, some disappointed girls left with a baby when the soldiers went off to join the unit in Europe and then back home to the US. By the 1960s, the housing stock had deteriorated and local policy fell in line with prevailing UK national policy of the day towards improving housing. But in Butte Town, that meant new social housing, and these tar blocks of flats were built to replace what were regarded uh, then as slums. Many long term residents were moved out to the new estates in other parts of the city. Uh, the result was a mixture of delight in their new homes and disappointment at the loss of their long established community. Even 60 years on, this loss is still felt to some extent. Uh, but new communities came along to uh, take their place. In 19 87 along came Cardiff Bay Development Corporation to regenerate the derelict docklands of Cardiff. Unused docks were filled in uh, and industrial dereliction closed, cleared away. Uh, this picture was taken from the tower of the uh, Pearhead building while that was happening. This is this, where's my, where is it gone? This is, this is Butte East Dock being filled in, which is now the site of the Millennium Centre and the Senate. Uh, part of these warehouses, uh, which date back to the 1870s, uh, is, is also preserved. Uh, it's moved a bit and is now preserved as part of Craft in the Bay Gallery. <clears throat> What have we got here? Yes, uh, yeah, the barrows was built, tidal mud was gone, uh, a loss that perhaps is not so sorely missed. The dereliction of the docks that, war, that has been replaced to a large extent by new residential developments and the Butte Town community has been further extended. Take a look at some of the, um, a, 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 just a random few pictures from our collection to show some of the community as it was. This is the Angelina Street Mission in around 1930. The, the guy in the middle here with a big moustache uh, is a Mr. Bowyer, who was a leading figure for many years. Apart from handing out soup, the Angelina Street Mission was somewhere where the people of Butte Town could meet. Children attend a Sunday school, wits and holiday treats, wits and treats were organized and part of the, as part of the Christian ministry, a benevolent club provided uh, food and clothing for the destitute.
uh, South Church Street School in 1930. Uh, I think the wide ethnic backgrounds can be clearly seen. I think you can also identify a community uh, maybe at the lower end of the socio-economic scale. The wedding uh, around 1920, the happy couple are Mohammed Hassan, a Somali seaman, and Katie Link. A pretty grand looking affair, I think, illustrating the high level of uh, racial tolerance and integration in the community. Uh, this is a ship's crew taken around 1910. Uh, steamship crew, many are thought to have been living in Butan, and certainly at least one of them has descendants still around today. Uh, Green Jack here is the grandfather of the chairman of today's meeting, Gaynor. A quick look at some of the history and some of the people that formed Tiger Bay, uh, Butown, and Cardiff Docks. Um, thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Trevor. Um, Trevor set the scene for us, um, how Tiger Bay Butte Town uh, began. Um, and like Trevor said at the beginning, sort of whistle stop tour, but left lots of um, room for questions. Um, if you could just hold on to those questions because the next speakers will take the story on and, and bring it up to date. When um, I've got a couple of questions myself, or you know, want to open up the debate, but we will, um, as I said, leave questioning to the end, if you don't mind, and we will move on to our next speaker, Mamona. Uh, are you ready, Mamona? I am, yes. Can okay, you hear me fine? Oh, yeah. yeah, over to you. Thank you. Um, so I just want to first of all say to um, James for inviting me. Honestly, I'm really um grateful to be part of such a great event um yeah so just want to say thank you to james and the team um and yeah just um a big uh welcome and borada to everyone thank you for joining us um i'm a little nervous but i'm extremely i was really into that presentation with trevor by the way i was so into it and then it's like yeah that's my presentation finished but maybe we'll have space and time for questions so much I was learning from that that I'd never actually come across. Um, so yeah, as Gaina initially um, introduced me, my name is Maimuna Solman. I'm of Somali origin and I was born and bred in Wales. Um, my father came to Wales and uh, Cardiff specifically in the 1960s. Um, and yeah, so I have six, six brothers and one sister. So there's eight of us. Four of my siblings were born in Somaliland, which is in East Africa, which is British Somaliland, colonized by um, Britain and then yeah, so I've, I've been back home twice. I mean, I say back home, but then Wales is also my home. So yeah, um, I, I'm going to do things a little bit differently. Um, I tend to express myself really well through spoken word. So I put together a piece um, for everyone, just which encapsulates really sort of anything to do with my identity and my experiences um, being born and bred in Cardiff and just some of my, my visions and how, how I feel. Um, about Wales and, and Cardiff in general. So I'm, I've called it, well, I've named it Dear Division and I'm gonna begin. Um, and then hopefully if there's any questions later on, if you any thoughts, if you wanna raise anything with me, anything that I've, I've put a lot in here and you know, I'm, maybe if there's like a trigger warning or something, if anyone wants to leave, maybe James can let them in, but it is really emotive and it includes a lot of information about my lived experiences and my lived wisdom being born and bred in Butte Town, but also going to different parts of Wales and whether I actually fit into Welsh society or not. So yeah, here goes. Dear Division, do I really belong where I don't belong? Am I the belonging you once longed for but never really got hold of? Am I the difference you want to divide? Am I the real Welsh person you want to represent Wales? Dear Division, 
Do I belong in a nation so intolerant to the melanin in my skin and the experiences that it brings, yet tolerated the enslavement of those that look like me, were cultured and interesting like me, but didn't fit in like me? Didn't fit in like me, but were the perfect fit for your hands of exploitation? Do I need to fit in where I don't feel wanted? Wanted for who I am, but what the color of my, what the color of my skin has made you think I am from? Dear Division, is Wales my home, is Welsh my culture, or will you accept that my identity is rooted in African ancestry, wrapped in Welsh cakes, fragranced by spices, creative through poetry or gabay as we say in the Somali language, and enriched by the intricate steps of Somali folk dance? Dear Division, look at me, look at my face, what do you see? What do you see when I say my name, say my race, and still say I am Welsh proudly? African roots and Welsh live in, that's me. When you think of belonging, identity, Welshness, do you think of me? Do you think of my melanated skin or do you rewrite my identity in a book you've named the other? The colour of my skin is deep. So deep it hurts. Hurts to be judged, judged on the pigment underneath layers and layers of culture and identity, identity enriched in spices and aromas so strong and rich it attracts conversations of where I am from. Conversations entrenched in my daily being, my work, my life, my living. Where am I from? Who am I? I am the rose which stings the side of your lips when I say I am from here. Here I grew, I learned, here I lived, here is Wales. Where am I from? Do not ask me where I am from, but rather ask me where am I a local? Ask me what area I'm from, what school I went to, what street I grew up in and what neighbors I have and how all of this has shaped who I am today. Ask me where I'm known. Known for who I am and not what the colour of my skin has made you think I am from. You see, people look at me as the other, the terrorist and sometimes the helper. You see, the melanin in my skin and the identity that it brings is more than a country, a place, a flag. It's a melting pot of happiness, joy, culture, language and tradition. A tradition so rich it oozes with aromas of spice, Somali folk dance and camel milk. You see, it baffles me when people say, where are you from, followed by where are you really from? Go back to your country or you do not belong here because my skin color doesn't look Welsh. I replied with it, it was the people with the color of my skin and culture and heritage who were enslaved and took part in your identity, your history and your economy. What do you see when you look at me? Do you see a police officer, a Welsh language speaker, a sportswoman, a construction worker, an academic, a politician, or do you see oppression, indifference, anger and fear? Tell me, what do you see? You see, I am human, I am Muslim, I am black, I am female, I am Welsh, I am me. You see, division doesn't recognize Tiger Bay. Division doesn't see a strong sense of community. Division doesn't want to see Tiger Bay. Division doesn't want to see solidarity or sense of unity. You see, division sees gentrification through the lens of privilege. Division sees profit over values and principles. Division is clouded by power, power with less melanin. Division doesn't want to hold on to the, to the bonds of Butte Town, the conversations at events in my community center, or the social glue of solidarity that bonds my community together. Dear Division, when you see racism, do you think of the effect that it has on my mind, body or being, or do you jump to the defense of the instigators, the racism deniers, and the accusation starters? Do you get scared to speak up, act up, and then show up to that meeting of support for your dark skinned colleague or your colleague wearing a headscarf? Dear Division, when you see racism, do you think of the effect it has on, has on my mind, body or being, or do you jump to the defense of the instigators? You see, division doesn't realize that living and walking in black skin is being followed by security in a government building. It's being told your name is too foreign or too difficult to pronounce for a job interview. Living while being black is being told you're the elephant in the room. It's being told you sound too common. It's being told you speak very good English. How long have you been learning Welsh? When did you move here? What's ironic is that's the same black skin that was used to build the buildings you now work in, the houses you now live in, and the money that feeds the same mouth that says that I am less than. I am less than in terms of, sorry, dear division, you may be aware that I am less than in terms of equality, I am less than in terms of job status, I am less than in terms of equity, but I am more than in terms of empowerment. I am more than in terms of resilience, and I am more than in terms of fighting for my rights. My human rights are the power that strengthens my voice. It's the power that gives me confidence to hold hands with my accomplices, not allies, but also gives me strength to dimmer the light of those with more tools in the box that was created by me. But division can stay divided. 
Segregated and privileged, what dismantles this obstructive systemic form of othering is the melting pot of culture and tradition that holds its power as Tiger Bay has won. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamuna. Thank you. Um, yeah, very powerful, raising lots of issues that we need to discuss. Um, can I hold, can you remember the questions that you want to ask of uh, Mamuna or the areas you want to take forward for further discussion yeah. until we've had the uh, last speaker? Is that okay with you all? Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can we now move on to Yasmin? Uh, are you ready, Yasmin? Uh, yes, I am. Please bear with me as I make my Zoom background like as professionally appropriate. Bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Gaina, and um, it is lovely to see you. Hi, hi, everybody. Thank you also for bearing with me. Um, family member was taken to hospital last night. So I've had um, a bit of a knock on in terms of my timetabling. Uh, so I'm really grateful um, to James, to Muna, to Gaynor and for everyone else and Trevor too, uh, for bearing with me. Um, James has a PowerPoint up that um, I've sent him. So um, I'm gonna wait for, oh, excellent. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Um, please may we go from the first slide. Thank you so much. Um, one moment, bear with me. Um, my name, so I'm Jochen Varjaunichi, Vrenui U Yasmin Begum, Rundodok Ayrtis. I'm 27 years old and uh, I live in my hometown of Cardiff in Wales. My pronouns are she, her, and I work in the creative industries in my day job. And uh, I'm really grateful for Xavier for hosting me this morning to talk about Tiger Bay. Um, I've always been interested in Tiger Bay for various different reasons because of the almost archetypal relationship to multiculturalism that it shares not only to Britain and in Britain, but also importantly, like of and in the British Empire. I've got a personal connection in some ways because um, my late great grandmother for whom I was a carer ran the big Windsor in Cardiff Docklands. And uh, that's also where my grandmother was born. And on my father's side, my brother and my stepmother still live on the 10th floor of um, Loudon Block. Um, so I'm really, I've got like, like a few different reasons basically that all, all ties that draw me there. Um, but more prominently, I'm, um, or most prominently, I'm interested in the idea of the insider outsider dynamic and the proliferation of post-colonial theory and discourse on heritage. Um, so I did a project on the 1919 race riots after a friend called Kyle Legault suggested that it would be an interesting idea to live tweet the race riots. Kyle Legault is Gaynor Legault's nephew and he lived on my council estate as a child in Grangetown. So to have this idea suggested to me by someone who's older than me and then just be like, hi Kyle, are you okay? Can I do that thing? Was um, really amazing because um, Kyle works as an artist for National Theatre Wales so to know an artist growing up and to know an artist who was employed and then to know an artist who was employed full time of his job, it was just like this massive game changer for me and um, everybody that I knew. Uh, we used a variety of different software to um, undertake the 1919 Race Riots Project and that's what I'll be talking to you about today. Thank you. Uh, next, next slide, please, James. Thank you so much. So I've just run through all of that, um, 27. So I'm seventh generation Cardiffian. So, um, you know, if you go back six generations, you'll find people in my family in Cardiff. Um, please may I have the next slide? Thank you. So uh, this next bit is a brief introduction to Tiger Bay. This is a photo I got from the Tiger Bay um, Heritage website. I really like it um, because I often find that um, a lot of the black and white photography of the time just leaves me a bit cold because there's always like a gaze, whether that is like a white gaze, a male gaze, a cisgendered white male gaze, but I always acutely feel it. and like especially as like a Bain woman, like a lack of Bain women, especially in like early 20th century photography from that area. So these sort of like um, visual landscapes that articulate the, 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 the geospatial geography and landscape of Tiger Bay prior to regeneration and prior to gentrification is really important for people like me because um, I was four when the Cardiff Bay Redevelopment Corporation was started. 
So some of my earliest memories are looking at those mud flats, and as an adult, it's the the experience of of the, of the docks of Tiger Bay of Butte Town. Like as a young person, and now as an adult, especially around sort of more recent discourses relating to um, deaths in police custody and experiences of policing. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so located on the southern arc of the east side of the waterway in Cardiff, about 0.5 miles west to the east and 1.3 north south was an area that was once known as Tiger Bay, irrevocably bound by the bodies of water that surround it, reinforced by the 1919 race riots, according to, to Keith Murrell. Um, it was an island bound by canals and water, which itself led um, to the creation of the name Rat Island because it was literally an island, something that you might, might not know if you walk through Canal Park today. So uh, the creation of Tiger Bay by the third Marquess of Butte made him the richest man in the world at the time, and Cardiff was his playground. A thriving Dockland that only expanded as Welsh coal expanded, and the South Wales coal fields grew to be the most productive in the world. They fueled the industrial age in Britain, the empire, and across the world. A second and third and later fourth and fifth dock was built to keep up with demand, and the population of Cardiff exploded like literally overnight. So um, according to Sophie Gilliatt Ray and Jodie Meller, who were scholars at the Cardiff Centre for Study of Islam at Cardiff University, Tiger Bay was a microcosm of empire. So um, the creation of the Suez Canal, the creation of their Aden British Protectorate and the Somaliland British Protectorate that uh, Muna um, touched upon were all push and pull factors that drew in um, merchant Navy seamen from across the world to, um, to come and work in Butte Town. Um, likewise, there were Lashkas, um, a Farsi word meaning army. Um, so, uh, or is it sailor, soldier? And um, thank you. Yeah. So, um, if you could go to that next slide, please, on the map of Butte Town. Thank you. So, this is an older map of Butte Town. People from over 50 different places lived here. And by the early 1900s, Tiger Bay was exporting 9 million tons of coal a year. This made it the second largest Dockland in the world after New York City, which was like the largest one in the world. About 10 years later, at the second largest population of Black, Asian, and minority ethnic people in um, any in Britain, anywhere outside of London. And because the nature of the, the island, it was very, very densely populated. So it was like the most BAME area, if that makes sense. Um, so it was the densest population of BAME people anywhere in the UK. And um, it was also the largest BAME population outside of England, in Wales, in Scotland by default. Um, naturally, Tiger Bay has been an enduring site of study around a number of topics and themes relating to its maritime heritage and um, ripe location for discourses and sub subalternity. Uh, so the uh, next slide, please, James. Thank you so much. The influential American anthropologist, St. Clair Drake, was one of a handful of black people trained in anthropology in the USA during the um, early to mid 20th century. Um, and in 1954, he wrote his PhD on the racial association and classification uh, in British Isles life from the Chicago School of Anthropology in 1954. So um, the Chicago School of Anthropology is quite, quite noticeable because basically anthropology and ethnography has always been like extraordinarily racist because of its ties to knowledge production and empire. So um, Chicago School of Anthropologists have sort of took that and flipped it on its head. Um, so Butte Town and Tiger Bay also feature in the work of Stuart Hall, Glenn Jordan, Humayun Ansari, uh, Ron Gies wrote this amazing book on Sufism if you're interested, Sophie Gilliatt Ray and other academics including Neil Evans who's on the call right now. Hi Neil. <laughs> Hiya. Um, next slide please. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, the 1919 race riots on, it was the hottest day of the year. Every, uh, no, it was all peak. That's like youth slang for it being quite tense. Uh, tensions erupted severely in Cardiff and it created a race riot. It was the first of three days of people kicking off. And these series of kicking off, it irrevocably changed the course of the history of the city. It left a devastating effect on communities in loads of different ways. Um, for example, three people died and many people were deported. And given the contemporary discourses on things like Windrush and Foucauldian ideas of like knowledge and power. I think that's really pertinent to talk about that the British government deported met like black men from the same dock where the Senate sits without any black women in it. Um, so on the 11th of June 1919 mobs grew at the north end of Butte Street after a fight broke out. A bunch of black men had gone out with their white partners for a picnic. They came back, it escalated and gunshots were fired and a man's throat later slit in an unrelated incident on Caroline Street which you might know as Chippy Lane if you've ever gone on a night out. Um, crowds immediately ventured south to Butte Street and Butte Terrace and the police were there saying listen yeah these sailors they got guns so you don't want to mess with them because the police they didn't have guns the police touch wood still don't have guns in Wales next slide please uh, so um, crowds chased them 
to the corner of Butte Street and Butte Terrace. And uh, the crowd grew larger as the news spread and they desperately tried to storm Butte Town. Police advised them not to do it and the scene would repeat itself with varying intensity to varying degrees with this trigger point or focal point of, the, of like a barricade, if that makes sense. And in a film that actually features Gaynor Legault interviewing Beatrice Sinclair, the mother of Neil Sinclair, the, at the beginning of Tiger Bay is My Home, um, an older gentleman talks about his father's experiences of the riots and he says, um, they were always coming over the bridge. We went to the bridge, we fought them back at the bridge. That's what my father told me. And that's always really stayed with me because I'd never seen a depiction of it on like S4C or BBC, but then here's like I'm Bivalanda Sivanandan's Institute, the Institute of Race Relations and Race and Class talking about something that my great great grandparents were in. So obviously that, you know, it was like, um, like, a, like a huge spark going up. So uh, when Tiger Bay was stormed, mobs went door to door wreaking havoc. People were beaten in grotesque instances of racist violence, a lot of it which is probably quite traumatic and triggering to go into. Somali and Yemeni boarding houses were stormed by people. In one, in one memorable instance, a group of young Somali and, Som and Somali lander men holed up into the second floor of a room and simultaneously drew fire on like 40 people. Bits of it are documented in a Somali seafarer, an early biography uh, written by Somali lander poet and seaman Ibrahim Ishmael, who self-described himself as being born in the year of antelope killer. In a piece written by Dr. Glenn Jordan in A Tolerant Nation, he examines an oral history interview with a woman in the late 1900s. Basically, there's a woman called Nora. Nora's bane, she chats about a grandma. A grandma's a white woman. A grandma went up and down Butte Street distributing guns to men, perhaps implicitly knowing she was less likely to be stopped and searched um, as a white woman than, say, as a black man. Um, next slide, please, James. Thank you. So this was... Um, this would have been one of the focal points where it kicked off or rather where the tensions erupted. So here on the north side closest to us, we can see central Cardiff. That will be around the, if you've ever, you ever gone drinking, this is around the Great Western Avenue, around the bottom. <coughs> Sorry, that's my dog. Um, around the bottom end of St. Mary Street, um, around Jacob's Market, which historically used to be a cracker factory. Um, it's now uh, on Callaghan Square. Um, next slide, please. Sorry again about my background noise. So this is the book, A Tolerant Nation, um, Revisiting Ethnic Diversity in a Devolved Wales. This is the piece that Glenn Jordan talks about, um, or rather this is the chapter within which Jen Glenn Jordan discusses an interview about a woman talking about her grandma's experiences of the race riots. Um, next slide, please. Thank you so much. In the documentary, The Hard Stop on the London 2011 race riots following the death of Mark Duggan, Stafford Scott talks to Marcus Howe about how the 1988 Broadwater farm riot started. Scott shares his experiences of police racism, saying they had no chance but to fight them and that when Alsatian dogs were sat on the group of young men, he says, why I call it an uprising is because they attacked us and we fought back. And he says that nothing has changed from the, um, the death of C Cynthia Jarrett that sparked the 1988 Broadwater farm riots to Mark Duggan. The starting points of 1988 and 1919 are drastically different given the deaths of uh, Cynthia Jarrett, the history of the Metropolitan Police Force and of Cardiff as a maritime colonial city. But for me, um, Scott's comments invite further interrogation on the term or the location of the idea of race riot in relation to the events of June 1919. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that a riot is the voice of the unheard, but what is the location of the unheard individuals in relationship to the race riots? especially the fact that the perpetrators of the race riot are the unheard voices themselves. The 1919 race riots and the fortification of Butan as a community, combined with later riots such as the um, Somali, Somali Lashka riots make a fertile site within which um, conversations and discourses of uh, historical people's resistance and radical ideas of grassroots, working class anti-racist organization are embodied and found. And this is found through an examination of the political and personal lives of the Tiger Bay community. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you so much. Um, so um, I think a lot about this because of the wider violence that took place towards migrant and Bain communities in the UK, such as the implementation of the Alien Order Act, it made a hostile environment for merchant Navy seamen. And then there was like a mass repatriation of Bain seamen to other countries. But proportionally, not as many people wanted to go from Cardiff as other areas. And when ships did wash up in places like Jamaica, the ship was mashed up. They tried to destroy the ship. It was vandalized. They got there. And on one instance, a group of men wrote a letter to David Lloyd George, I think. Sorry, my history is always really bad, which is ironic, given that I'm here. Um, you know, they said to him, listen, you know, our wives, our children, our sons, they're all in Cardiff. We want to go back to Cardiff. They said, look, you can't go. 
but the thing is that they were technically British subjects. So they were British subjects in the British Empire, but they couldn't go back to Britain. So I was really grateful for Gindy Andrews in Back to Black, where he says that um, the experiences of the Anglophone colonized countries of the Caribbean as settler colonizer, well, plantation nations, like that relationship that those communities share with the UK, he says, is really similar to that of like the antebellum US South and those communities with the north of the USA. Um, next slide, please. Thank you so much. So um, I was taught about, um, there isn't a lot of discussion on the 1919 race riots. It's not widely studied apart from a handful of works. There aren't many cultural depictions of it. This is unlike other instances of riots and resistance in Welsh memory, like the Charter that fries in, the Merthyr riots, the Rebecca riots, the Miner strikes, Tonopandi riots, Pandering and Crory strike, or other instances of resistance in Welsh people's history other than those six. This is reflective of a wider institutional and cultural pattern of behaviour towards topics in historiography relating to Welsh identity and Welsh history around Bane history, with recent discussions on anti-racism leading Amgeth for Cymru or National Museum of Wales to release a statement admitting their part in upholding and perpetuating systemic racism. But how can you uphold systemic racism when you're subject to the 2011 amendment under the Race Relations Act, which puts um, on institutions a due regard to promote good race relations? So I'm really interested by how these ideas of like race riots that like our ancestors went through become like these like battlegrounds for modern day conversations on being third sector and the legacy of um, a Wima, along with the decolonization topic in humanities as a commentary on the post-colonial turn in humanities. Um, so Welsh Bain people are located at an intersection of being Bain where most conversations on Bain people and communities in the UK focus on like England. Conversations on Welshness very rarely, albeit more now than historically interrogate Welsh identity and the Welsh cultural and political sphere around race and ethnicity, creating an idea essentially of whiteness as Welshness or Welshness as whiteness, both of which are different but interlinked if we use like Sarah Ahmed's derived like framework to look at EDI around this area. The history of Welsh people of colour communities therefore, especially black Welsh communities, shed lights on these areas around a variety of different things like the historical experiences of Welsh people of colour, all of which are linked but separate and it is embodied in the cultural experiences, academic output and the cultural production of those who bridge the inside or outside of dynamic to create meaningful and often provocative like interactions, if that makes sense, like Kaya Lugor, for example. Um, please may I have the next slide. Thank you so much. So this is a depiction of um, the uh, Rebecca riots. I was taught about this for my history GCSE, I got that in 2010. I wasn't taught about 1919, but there's something about Rebecca that makes history pop that it doesn't when it comes to uh, being people in South Cardiff, if that makes sense. Um, next slide, please, too. Thank you so much. So um, as some of you will know, this is uh, from the Penderdon Quarry strike. And the reason I talk about Penderdon is because I find that um, uh, Anglo-centrism and its proliferation in um, Welsh academic spheres have led to um, our own insider insider discourse is not only around Welsh identity and language, but around North-South divides, language divides. So the fact that he had two kids and he called one of them Sugar, one of them Slate, combined with Charlotte Williams sort of legacy, I think that like we haven't really had as many conversations on this as we should as a nation, especially around like where the money came from and about trans transatlantic slave trade. And often like as a Cardiffian, like, please, I'm begging you, like, let's drag these conversations out of Cardiff, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, let's look at other places. Let's look at how things like this happened. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so this is um, a scene from Kyle Gore's graphic novel on the 1919 race riots. This is available online. Um, it's not like, it's more accessible than like a traditional book. Like you can play audio clips from it, which I think is great. Um, you can look up additional links and it's been created with an academic called Dr. Mike Pearson, who um, is based at the University of Aberystwyth, but also Cardiff University with a and uh, basically, so it's like a historian and an artist and they got together and what they've created is really, really robust around these two different areas. Um, so I'd really recommend it. I um, mean, you can also look at it on your phone. You know, if you haven't got a laptop, that's not an issue here, which is, I think, really important. Um, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. So um, this is um, a contemporary, this is, you know, if you stand over by Grangetown near Clarence Bridge, like near that way, and then you look, you look eastbound towards Splot, like this is what you'll see in the pier head, that was there, like, um, you know, when my um, step-grandfather, um, a seaman from um, Trinidad and Tobago came, he would have seen that building there. The one on the left, he wouldn't have seen, the one on the right, that only came when I was six because of devolution. <laughs> um, so it's, the geography is massively, massively changed, you know, from that first image we looked at to the second image. Um, I wanted to um, explore the 1919 race riots because I had a bad experience of stop and search. And I felt really upset by the epidemic we were experiencing in incarceration. 
and I felt really passionately that um like how can I put it it's like just because um you think it's shit doesn't mean it should always be shit part of my French you know I felt that like as a young person as a woman as a queer person as a Welsh language learner like even though I didn't necessarily see Asian people in St Fagans that didn't mean I couldn't not do the 1919 race riots Twitter account because it wasn't I knew it was going to be a good idea because it came from Kyle and I've known Kyle since I was a child and um like I just felt like so frustrated frustrated at my proximity to like academia at my proximity to police violence my um, proximity to these lived experiences so it was just it came out in a burst I didn't anticipate like um how how many people would read it or how many people would interact with it so I was stopped and searched the day before well, on the anniversary of the Newport race riots and accused of being a crack dealer. And like, no one had crack on them. We, it was just a stop and search. They just, I think they wanted to make up arrest numbers. And, you know, I had the sort, like I wasn't given a ticket. They asked me loads of super racist questions. They took me to Newport police station. And um, I felt really angry at what I'd experienced because that day I'd been recording with Hanch. Hey, bless her. Shh. I'm recording with Hanch and S, with S. Padwadak on the 1919 race riots. And I whipped out my contract. I said, officer, I'm not a crack dealer. I'm a journalist. It would look, she's got, she's, got, um, she's got a contract. She is a journalist. And I thought, oh my days, if I didn't have this contract, would they legitimately think I was a crack dealer? You know, like, would they have enough to arrest me on and put me in overnight? And, you know, if I hadn't have dressed in, like, if I dressed in a tracksuit and not in a suit, would I not have been driven back? Those sort of questions. So I was aware that, like, my experiences then weren't too similar dissimilar from the experiences of other young mixed race people in Wales 100 years ago. So um, the 1919 race riots exist as contested history because Welsh people of colour communities are located at an intersection of being Welsh and being people of colour at a time, a peak time of conversations on, and like a, during a peak time of, of conversations on the anti-racism renaissance in the United Kingdom, especially when we sort of decolonize the decolonizing discourse from the global north. But as I mentioned earlier, who really is like an unheard voice? Uh, what do the 1950 race riots mean for Welsh memory? What do they mean for heritage? And most importantly, what does it mean for young Bay men under 20 who are still experiencing incarceration, stop and search, wind rest and deportation after two young black men have died in police custody in South Wales since the beginning of this year? Thank you so much for listening. Sorry, that was a bit of a whistle stop tour. And thank you ever so much to James for um, being uh, helping me with the PowerPoint because I've got really bad executive dysfunction today. Thank you. Thanks everyone for listening. I'm going to clap you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin. Thank you. Um, can can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. Um. We've had three presentations, um, three very different presentations. Um, they've certainly given me um, lots to think about. One of the issues for me is um, my pleasure in hearing the voices of the younger generation. I grew up in old Tiger Bay, you know, so you know, the perception of of uh, of Mamuna and Yasmin, um, the sense that they feel about their home the same way that I feel about my home, although it's a very different place to the, that which I grew up in. The links between the history, I think, um, what happened in in terms of the presentation Trevor gave us, the development of the docks and how Tiger Bay itself began and what is happening now, um, there are so many similarities that it does, um, I think, uh, beg a lot of questions. So I won't talk anymore. I will now open the floor for questions from the audience. Um, I don't know how we're going to do this. Um, I, I think, the easiest way I can see somebody's hand, but I don't know whose hand it is. Oh, so, David, that's me. Um, uh, we've got a few questions in the um, the chat. Um, I'm more than happy to help where possible, and I put my hand up so I didn't um, talk over you. I'm just going to put my hand down now because I'm chatting. Okay, now I can see the chat. Okay, so I'll I'll read through the questions. 
Right, let me start at the beginning. Lots, lots, lots of, of praise for your presentations. I'm really glad that the audience liked them. Um, where is the question? Are there, I can't see any questions. Does anybody have a, a question or a comment they make? I think if you want to speak, just unmute yourself and speak. And I'll cut you off if you talk for too long. Yeah, Gaynor, thank you very much indeed, Gaynor. I thought there were two, there were three fantastic presentations. And uh, I found Mamuna's, especially and Yasmin's, very moving and very, very enlightening. I'm sorry, Trevor, I thought he was very good as well. But because I taught history for a long time and I worked at the National Museum, I'm sorry, I knew a lot of that before, but you presented it beautifully and so coherently. It's like such a, a strong story out of it. I would like to know where there are maps, there's anything that shows all those links between Cardiff and the world and the world and Cardiff, because you made that point, Trevor, it was kind of United Nations stuff. And I would like to see that visually. Is there anywhere I could do that? Thank you. Trevor, do you want to answer that or shall I? Uh, uh, I can answer it, I guess, by saying I don't know of any uh, such map. Um, I have to say it was one of those things that I have, have thought about over time uh, because we do have a uh, list of where the coal went and where the, and where the people came from uh in in reverse um could i put one together well i can have a go at some stage oh okay. trevor um some years ago um Bhutanian art center were funded by the round tree foundation and we put together some teaching material and in that teaching um in the little booklet we did a map of Bhutan and the links to other countries and the it was children were involved and it was the children from it was Mount Stewart School. They talked about where they came from and it made links on that map to the world. We should refresh it and, and publish it, I think. Yeah, because it's something to be proud of. Where it is. Yes, I do. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. I ask a question, I get an answer. Brilliant. Thank you. There's a question there about uh, Mamuna's um, Song, where is it? I've gone. It's gone. It's about, yes. Um, this is from Stephanie Bolt. Um, it says, inspired by Mamona's reading, I'm curious if you see these histories as song lines to be shared deeply so they can be carried through generations. And if so, how would you suggest sharing so, so we can all experience learning? That question is to Mamuna. Uh, thanks, Stephanie, um, for your uh, kind words. Thank you so much. Um, I probably would say um, I do see a song line. Now you give me the um, <laughs> explanation because I actually haven't heard of that before. Um, but yeah, I probably would say through education and teaching, um, you know, making it part of the curriculum. So education, everything I talk about, anything we do talk about, always comes down to education, and which is key. Um, so yeah, I'd probably say schools and, you know, making making it part of maybe the curriculum within schooling, or just ensuring that young people um, from a very young age are actually taught this um, as part of the, the curriculum, or even like extracurricular activities. Um, that's what I would say to that. Can, can I... Just say one of the um, one of the uh, issues in um, two things. One, um, Yasmin mentioned Sinclair Drake, and um, Sinclair Drake was the mentor of Glenn Jordan, and Glenn Jordan came to Cardiff to complete the uh, dissertation Sinclair Drake. And that's how Bhutan Eastern Art Centre um, got started. And had that, not, had that not happened, the collection that we're now working on would not exist, you know, in the recordings. So for me, the importance of capturing history now, because history is now, um, mm. is, is vital, you know. And I think we would, um, we would have lost a wonderful, 
resource. And, and the, other, the other key point that struck me was about the 1919 race riots and the whole issue of migration and um, the hostile environment um, that was um, discussed in the press when Theresa May was prime minister, but in fact had been in existence since 1919. And I was struck at that time by how um, the British government has just repeated itself over and over, forced migration, um, the taking back of, of identification around passports in 1919. It was Siemens passports in, in 2019. It was um, denying British citizens the right to have a British passport and deporting them. So, you know, the, 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 the discrimination um, continues and um, it is, I think, only by discussing these issues that people become aware of what is going on around them because so many people, because it doesn't touch them, uh, are not aware, not aware of what is going on. I just felt, um, I wanted this to say that. There's something uh, from Georgina Grit Grittins. I would love to see similar research being done on the capital of North Wales. <laughs> Liverpool, how dare you? So many communities involved, so much material to understand. I, I have to contest the capital of North Wales in Liverpool, but I know what you mean, you know. Do you want to say something about that, Georgina? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. No, I've read it in a couple of um, historical sources locally that uh, Liverpool was called the capital of North Wales in the early 19th century. It's kind of stuck because of the links with slavery and the port of Liverpool and Wrexham being such heavily, so heavily involved. Um, but apart from the talks on Clafford, I just haven't had time to go into it. I have found a couple of specialist archives in Liverpool, specialising in the Liverpool Welsh communities but they're shut. <laughs> but they have, <laughs> but they have got some um, specialist archivists who will answer questions and help you. So I'm looking forward to that one day, and um, I'm very grateful to Neil Evans as always, who's given me a book uh, in the chat line there by John Belcham, and it's called Before Windrush. So I'm going to look for that. And that's a really good starting point for me because I haven't really got one. I seem to have lots of threads, but no, nothing solid to start on. So uh, I'm sure there's an awful lot of um, fascinating history. There's so much, such a big non-conformist community in Wrexham at that time that had a lot of links with uh, Liverpool because a lot of them were from there and they, they all got each other jobs and got people this, this, they, they just helped each other out because a lot of them um, only spoke Welsh. So I think there's a, a lot there anyway. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, interestingly enough, whilst we were undertaking the audit of uh, commemoration of uh, the um, Atlantic slave trade, the links between Liverpool and the development of Wales was so apparent, you know. So um, uh, read that report as well. That's a good source of information. You know, I, I'd give you the link if I knew where to get it. But um, if, I'm sure if you went on the Welsh Government world website or something, um, you find it. There's another question from Erica. Why uh, can I ask about the name Tiger Bay? Why was it changed to Cardiff Bay? And was that a controversial decision at the time? Okay, uh, um, nobody knows why. Well, there's lots of theories of why the area was called Tiger Bay, but there's no definitive answer. Um, lots of, I said, stories, it looked like the Bay of Bengal, it, it, and the map, it looked like a tiger's head. The people were fierce, all sorts of nonsense, but the true answer is uh, nobody really knows. Can that be your homework? 
maybe if we work together, we might get to the truth of it. Why was it changed to Cardiff B? Well, I can tell you exactly why. Um, at a meeting with Cardiff, one of the early meetings, um, just to set the context, before Cardiff Bay was established, Foster Morgan County Council had already started redeveloping the area and they built the county hall. And South Glamorgan published the fact that they unashamedly wanted to redis redistribute wealth and activity from the north of Cardiff to the south of Cardiff. And they started that off by building County Hall and were um, in the process of developing the, 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 the derelict Auckland that, that um, Trevor showed you when um, the government of the day stepped in, uh, Margaret Thatcher's government, and um, the Secretary for State for Wales, whose name was Nick, I can't remember, and I cannot repeat in public the name that my husband gave him, but it rhymed with Nick, um, came to Cardiff, and at a very early meeting, there was talk about um, renaming that whole area. And so my husband, Paddy Kitson, said, wanted to retain the bay um, bit in commemoration of Tiger Bay, and so suggested it was called Cardiff Bay. And um, then later, that name was adopted as part of the development plan, and that's how Cardiff Bay came into being. So I blame him. I've never let him forget that um, because I thought it took something from my home. Um, but there you are. Everybody um, now calls it Tiger Bay and Butte Town. So there's still a separation. Any more questions? Um, um, I saw a question in the chat and uh, one moment, um, bear with me. So um, this question is from um, Eva Rapdavid and it says a uh, question. Um, so we're gonna quote verbatim now. Um, we are today talking about history, but as Maimuna powerfully articulated and as Yasmin referred to at the end, these are real questions for now. Could you unpack a little bit more about these intersections thinking about museums, especially when Boris Johnson's government is talking about cancel culture and how public institutions tell the history of Britain. I was really interested in this question because um, Gaynor, uh, I recently had the pleasure of reading the piece that you created for the Welsh government on um, on statues and memorialization. So uh -huh. I, um, I was keen, yeah, just to flag this. And even though it's addressed to my mood and myself, I think it might be also particularly beneficial if you might like to answer given your recent work. Okay, and moving on, I mean, with the, with, we undertook an audit of the, statues but we said but we can't just leave it there so there are a lot of next steps going on but importantly what I've been involved in over the last couple of months is the development of a quality action plan for Wales and um, we have it has been a lot of hard work very fast moving but we've managed to draw in all of the major institutions from across Wales including museums um, the museum separately set up a consultation group to look at how it functions, the, where, where it stands in terms of equity, and importantly, how it represents all of the population of Wales and the, all of the history of Wales. I, I don't need, I, but I will repeat it, to tell you all that history is usually written by the victor. Uh, it ignores the poor, the weak, and particularly women, um, and these are attempts. Lavia is an attempt to expose the true history to, in, to, in, to involve people. So there will be change. Um, and one of the things we've been very, very strong about is we are not, we are Wales. We are not going to copy what England does. Um, England um, and its view on culture is really a view of what London is like. It doesn't even represent, you know, all, all of England. So as I said, we're developing this plan and it should be going out for consultation um, in March. 
please have a good read and, and get involved and, and comment on it. Um, Ellen wants to speak. I don't know if Mamona and Jasmine want to say more of what I've just said. And then we go to Ellen. Yeah, yeah I'm uh, sorry. Oh, no, on. Ellen doesn't want to speak. Ellen wants, just wanted to clap hands on what you were saying, Gaina. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to go after Muna and I'm going to dig up that link of that um, audit and pop it in the chat. Yeah, I was just going to add you. something really quick um, with regards to um, Evo's question regarding um, museums. I think it comes down to representation, not just within staff, but within the work that's being presented within, within um, museums. And, you know, just the sim simple things, well, not really simple, but, you know, like temporary exhibitions on, on the contributions of Somalis or, um, you know, Somali landers. You know, my father's contribution um, or experience wasn't temporary. Um, you know, or sim similarly, similar, you know, other men like him, like himself as a, as a as a seaman, and you know, the contribution that he made wasn't temporary. So I think we deserve more than um, a temporary exhibition hidden away in museums. It's not really accessible to everyone. Um, just to really acknowledge people's um, history and contribution to Wales, and just yeah, I think that's just for me is such an important part. And there's so much learning that needs to be done. But it really does start with. Um, staff members that are actually um, recruited within museums and you know whether they actually look like the communities they're serving or not just wanted to add that yeah yeah well, I mean in terms of the the basic quality action plan that point not just about the museums but mm -hmm. all of the institutions and agencies yeah. in Wales mm -hmm. um, need to look at their recruitment policies and yeah. to, to do their best so yeah. yeah, there's um, definitely. Yeah, there's, I'm also working with Welsh government on the race quality action plan, and representation um, is 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 definitely always the first thing that comes up, and this is very important to me in terms of a good starting point. Representation definitely matters. It's a foundation. So yeah. Thank yeah, you. been mentioned um, a film I was involved in. It seems like you know I was looking at some still photographs. I'm so young and fresh faced. Oh. anyway. Um, in that film, we have a, a Somali man, um, Abdi Guri, called him, and um, he talked about coming to Cardiff in 1920 and what it was like and the way he was a seaman and the way in which the pay was separated. And he talked about the different pay scales for white seamen from um, Caribbean seamen from Arab seamen, and he said, Somali seamen and African seamen. And he said, you see how they separated us, Somalia and Africans? They tried to make us fight amongst ourselves, you know? And it, it, it's interesting that, um, in terms of how we see ourselves and how we integrate. Um, going back, listening to that man talking about 1920, you know? I often wonder how much has really changed. There's something in the chat about a uh, someone organised, it's from Steve Head. His wife is organising a conference and he's given a um, an email address for people who want to get involved. They're looking for um, working class, voices, young, female, black voices, um, especially welcome. Mm. Any, any more questions? Um, right. Questions, sorry, there's one more. Um, please may I answer the question briefly? Sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, please Yasmin, go ahead, ahead please. Thank sorry, you. yes. Um, I'm really interested on museums because a lot of museums are basically using public sector tax money to make out that they're not racist when they are racist. And if they'd done their due regard after what Stephen Lawrence's mum fought for when I was seven, none of this would be happening. So I'm really interested by how public money, so basically yeah, you buy crisps and the 20% VAT off the crisps, yeah, that goes into public money and then that all, that all gets sold out to different institutions so that Wales can ring up England and say, yes, I've got Welsh Jamaicans, they're in the museum. I've got five of them. I've got my KPIs for the new financial year. So this area of race, ethnicity, nationality, and multiculturalism between England and Wales, given the colonial dynamic that Wales shares with funding is really contested because um, maybe it's easier in Wales to bring in someone from 
Manchester to talk about people in Butte Town than it is to bring someone from Butte Town to talk about people in Butte Town because those relationships are very tense about who gets to represent whom. And I feel that this acutely plays out in museums. So as a child, I went to St. Fagans one week and National Museum in Wales the other week. So I was really grateful for like the early exposure to like the largest collection of Impressionism from Monet outside of France and on Welsh people's culture and history. But I never saw Somali people. I never saw Yemeni people. I never saw Asians. I never saw people from Trini. I never saw Jamaicans. So um, I'm really interested by Basically, who are the instigator of these conversations and who are the beneficiaries of these conversations? So, for example, Thomas Picton, he was a slave owner in Trinidad, liked to torture children, let's be really blunt, and especially young women. Um, and his statue, uh, I wrote a petition to get a statue brought down. And I did this because my um, stepdad's dad is from Trini. And I'm Asian and he is of African descent. So I'm aware of those dynamics, if that makes sense, and the sort of lived experience of being of the Trini diaspora while not looking of the Trini diaspora, but also looking of the Trini diaspora, if that makes sense. So um, I did this because um, I thought it was minging that people would eat there and they'd like party basically with this like horrific bloke in a statue form and we have to get him out. And I knew that after Colston, I wouldn't be able to get 20 Pakistani or 20 docks people or Grangetown people together to go and bring down a statue and chuck it into the docks feeder with Cardiff police station around the corner in the civic centre. So I had to go the formal posh route. And that posh route was the petition because I couldn't drag him into the canal myself. I had a lot of FOMO after Bristol. Um, so, but now there's, you know, the Sub-Saharan Advisory Panel in conjunction with National Museum of Wales. They've got a 30K fund. And then uh, this is going to go to an artist and um, that artist will be known as the person that addresses the legacy of Thomas Picton. So it's not so much about, say, who signed the petition or the experiences of, say, the people on, like, part of my friends, like fucking minimum wage working in, like, City Hall or, like, living below a, a living wage, having to, like, clean this statue. What it is is basically this conversation has been identified as a tense subject and whoever can be a beneficiary of this goes down in history books. So I feel that at the moment when it comes to, like, museums and whatnot, everyone wants to be a beneficiary of the change if that makes sense, not just museums, but in policing, around deaths in police custody, um, around discourses of multiculturalism and Welsh politics, but no one in my experience is really willing to spearhead those conversations because of number one, it's awkward. Number two, there's company back. So I'm really interested by how it plays out around Picton. Like why is it that the, the chair of the Sub-Saharan Africa Advisory Panel was selected to be the Black History Month worker for the museum? If the museum had given their due regard and uh, the Race Relations Act, none of all of this work would have happened when I was a child. So I'm really interested in museums because um, there's been this great book recently released called um, Brutus Museums by someone called, I think it's Dan something or another that looks at um, the Benin Bronzes, etc. cetera. Um, you know, um, the royal family sit with Welsh gold, but the, the jewels are also from Punjab. So all of these different conversations on museums, like it's also in town and you can get there on the 33 or the 66 or the city line, or you can, well, you know, you go to the British Museum and you go and see the Mold Cave, which is gross because it's in like Bloomsbury. But even though that like, it might seem really far removed from our day-to-day -day lives, like all of it belongs to us. So I'm really interested by how these conversations on multiculturalism and due regard play out institutionally, because I don't think that m my tax money or your tax money should be going on propping up people who are institutionally racist. Thank you for listening to that. Thank you. And and th those that conversation has been rehearsed a couple of times in different ways in the development of the Race Equality Action Plan. And one of the issues that was um, raised quite early on was why do we have to do this? You know, we've had legislation in place, like you said, Yasmin, so long. You know, why why isn't it happening? Why isn't there change? So the plan is very much focused on change and outcomes, not about talk, not about aspirations. All the departments have had to have goals and outcomes. So um, as I said, it's going to out for cons consultation. And I just urge you in particular, Yasmin, for everybody to get involved uh, with their comments, um, you know, um, because I, I agree with everything you, that you've just said. Thank you for saying it. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to that. I feel really strongly about it because um, I know that my position as a light-skinned South Asian woman with a British passport, like I'm very, very privileged. Like so privileged, like, in, you know, like I went to SOAS, like the amount of social capital that brings me when I apply for a job is unreal. 
So I know that like for people like my stepfather, who's no longer with us, like working class Welsh black man of Trini uh, descent, like I'm more likely, I'm less likely to get stopped and searched walking out of City Hall in Central Cardiff in a show alchemies than he is in like a suit just merely because of anti-blackness and racism. So I feel that we've all got a duty of care to like spearhead these awkward conversations because, you know, like um, I remember your nephew, Kyle, when he was my age and I was my sister's age in Grangetown in the 90s. And I want it to be better so that when maybe my brother and my sister have children or Muna has children or, you know, anyone has children, really, that it's better for them, too. So I'm really grateful. And thank you for, for your feedback on that comment, because I sometimes feel a bit nervous about, you know, just, just like bringing up Doreen Lawrence, basically, and why no one's done anything for the past 21 years, because then it becomes away from this abstract or more into higher. So and so didn't do 2000. I'm going to come for them, you know. Uh, well, <laughs> this whole set, this whole um series of, of debates is about migration and migration is about the experience of those who have moved and come to live here so everything you say has agency and has importance so I never feel you know scared or embarrassed or hesitant about speaking up we are silenced far too often thank you so, and thank you for the um, advert for Kyle I'll tell him <laughs> It was the only artist. It was like I used to say to my friends, "I know this bloke. He does art. He gets bare money." They were like, "What?" <laughs> you know. And then I could tell them to Google him. Yeah, yeah. and he, he's so talented. I'm very, very proud of him. Anyway, back to the subject. Never mind my family. <laughs> I just want to. I just want to raise a point. Um, I'm only talked about the Berlin Wall, and I'm assuming you talked about the wall that runs along. If you're from if you're from Tiger Bay, you say Butte Road. If you're not from the area, you say Butte Street. Why well, I always say Butte Road. Okay. So the wall that runs along um, Butte Road, is that the, what you're referring to as the Berlin Wall, Mamona? Yeah, yes, I was, yeah. Um, I mentioned in the chat there, um, because it's just a totally different feel on Lloyd George, the makeup and you know the way the houses are built and there's cycle paths that enable me to cycle there. Um, there's just a totally different feeling. And then, yeah, back into that Berlin Wall, I just feel that sense of community and, and belonging. And, and it was really interesting what um, Trevor was mentioning um, early, earlier on about the community of Butan being extended to Cardiff Bay. And I was just, I was thinking now from my experience, I don't actually see that in action. I, I can't really relate to that. Um, that sort of extension of, of being extended to Cardiff Bay because Cardiff Bay is starting to be unrecognisable. The gen level of gentrification is unbelievable. I mean, even in, in terms of trying to find somewhere to eat, trying to find somewhere to pray, I look around and I think, is this really my home? But then I totally feel different when I'm in Hodges Square or Loudoun Square. Um, so yeah, I, lots of people, my family members, lots of younger people will see that wall as, as a huge division. Um, and divider between the, the two communities, essentially. When when Cardiff Bay was consulting about what they were going to do, one of the proposals they put forward was demolishing the wall mm. and spreading the building uh, right across. They were they began negotiations with um, not British Rail. It's not called British Rail, but anyway, the people who ran who owned the railway line. Yeah, there was a hue and cry from Butte Town. You know, people actually said, "If you knock down, you knock down that wall over my dead body. That wall's been there since eighteen something, and you leave it where it where it is." So the wall stayed, mm. and the development went on the other side. So there are lots of people from Butte Town do live the other side of the wall around mm. Lloyd George Avenue, etc. But it is. Um, I mean, it looks, it feels, it smells totally differently. So, yeah, yeah. you know, that is, um, and I often think we fought to protect Butte Town, but looking back, I think that we chose the wrong battlegrounds. Mm. So the Butte Town was not just protected, it was ignored. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's fascinating because when I'm on the other side of the Berlin Wall, I get people saying, go back to where you come from. And, and I just, you know, go and wash the mud off your, your body and all this sort of really nasty, ignorant stuff. And you think, do you even know where you're standing? Tiger Bay. <laughs> I mean, I've had so people that you say, this is not our Britain, this is not our Wales. Some can't even face me and my family or, or siblings or whatever, but literally in disgust 
like looking away from us. And I had a conversation with, with three elderly um elderly people and that look and that stare is is very visible to me. I mean, I get vibes straight away, which really encourages me. It really does encourage me and push me, pushes me to actually have conversations with people rather than keep me away. And yeah, they were saying basically, this is not our Britain, what are you doing here? And I, just, I was just so taken aback and saying, this is actually Tiger Bay. Do you know the history? Like my father was was invited to this country, you know, um, to come and work here and provide social capital and his energy and his, his input. And, you know, constantly having these historical conversations with people and educating people on the go regularly. Just haven't been given the title of being a teacher, but it's this whole thing about dismantling ignorance like on a regular basis, whether, whether I'm on a bike or not on a bike um, and all, all, all sorts. It's just, there's just so much that needs to be done in terms of raising awareness of our history. And it begins with, obviously the, the curriculum and well, black history was always was always Welsh history. It was just never recognized. So this whole thing about it was, it's trying to be made like it's a new phenomenon is just mind blowing. I mean, black people have always existed since they've ever existed. So, um, yeah, it's just it's just really fascinating. And, you know, I'm constantly having conversations with people all the time and actually saying, you're asking me to go back to somewhere that I'm supposed to come from when you actually are, are so ignorant about the history of where you're standing. So, yeah, it's just I yeah. find it really fascinating. Muna, do you remember when we went to the Eisteddfod? Oh, Yeah. <laughs> And people were literally like saying, why are you here? This is for Welsh language speakers. I'm like, do you mean white Welsh language speakers? Can you just sort of clarify that and be explicit in what you mean? Don't shy, like don't shy away from your ignorance. Be very specific with your ignorance if you're going to be ignorant. Um, but yeah, it's just this whole thing about, if you say, oh, you shadow and ride, like, you know, people are literally nearly falling over the place, like in shock. And I'm like, that's the shock that we need to tap into constantly. <laughs> But yeah, and it's regular conversations, but you have to be persistent and resilient in those conversations to constantly challenge that and not shy away from it. Okay, how are we doing for time, um, Ian? Being that, yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Could, um, yes, conscious of time. Could we take one more question? Um, any more questions? Okay. Oh, okay, then I will thank you all. Thank you in particular to our, our speakers. And um, I'm gonna hand you over now to Ian, who's going to conclude this session. Thank you, everyone. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Gaida. And on behalf of everyone, I'd like to extend our grateful thanks once again to you for chairing, to Mamuna, Yasmin and Trevor for offering us such a range of powerful and engaging uh, social, cultural and historical perspectives on Tiger Bay. Many thanks. Thanks also to you, the audience, for your comments and questions via chat. Grateful thanks to the organisers, James, Sean, Darren, Mawen and Matthew. Um, as I said at the start, today's session is the second in our new spring series of online events. Um, I hope you'll join us for our next event, which will be held on Thursday, uh, 11th of March at 7 p.m., and which will be entitled um, Heritage and Memory Exploring Jewish Wales. Uh, the event will be chaired by Laura Henley, and the speakers will be Kai Parry Jones, John Minx, and Nathan Abrams. Details of how to sign up for the event can be found on our website and also on Clavers Twitter and Facebook pages. Uh, and they will also be emailed to, to members in the coming week. Also, if you've missed any of our previous online events from 2020, or if you were unable to join us for last week's first session, recordings of all our events are available via the Flava website. A recording of today's event will also be uploaded there in due course. Uh, it only remains for me to say thank you once again for your support and look forward to welcome you back on Thursday, the 11th of March. Dielkin Vaurian, thank you very much.